Hello, everybody. Today, I have a wonderful guest for you. I have the one and only Vincent Racaniello, a professor of virology at Columbia, and in his spare time, host of TWIV, This Week in Virology, as well as other science communication podcasts. And he is here to talk to us about polio, polio vaccines, and polio vaccine misinformation. Vincent, hi, how are you? Good to see you, Dan. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Good to be here too. Awesome. Yeah. Good to have you. You see what I do. I, I mess, I stumble over my words all the time and I have to restart. Okay. No worries. But anyway, um, so the reason I wanted to have you on today is because polio vaccines have been in the news lately, not super, not getting a lot of attention, but they've been in the news and they've been in a new, in the news in a way where I think anti-vaxxers might eventually pick up on it, especially with people like RFK Jr. now running for president. I don't doubt for a second that eventually people are going to start recycling polio vaccine misinformation. And so instead of letting that stuff just travel as far as possible on the internet before any science communicators get a chance to get on top of it, I figure we can talk about it here and have this video ready to go for anybody who wants to address that misinformation when it comes. So good plan, good plan. Yeah. So let's get right into it. Um, you're an expert in this area and you've been working on polio vac uh, polio virus in your lab for a long time. Um, can you give us just a brief history of polio vaccines, IPV versus OPV and OPV versus the new NOPV? All right. So let's start very briefly with what is polio, right? There's a disease caused called polio, which is a paralytic disease. And then there's the virus that causes it, polio virus. So polio uh, is a paralyzing disease that we've known about for thousands of years, which became epidemic around the beginning of the 1900s and more and more cases a year. And, and what happens is it's caused by ingesting fecal material that contains the virus. So uh, let's say you don't wash your hands and, and you've just touched someone who has a little bit of feces on their hands after going to the bathroom and they didn't wash their hands either. You get it, you put it in your mouth, the virus travels down into your intestine, goes through the stomach, goes into your intestine, starts to multiply, and you shed lots of it in your feces, so you then transmit it to uh, other people. But then in some people, the virus not, not only gets into the blood and circulates, but gets into the brain and spinal cord. And there the virus destroys neurons. And of course, neurons are what make your muscles move. And then you destroy enough neurons and you can't move. You can't move your legs, you can't move your arms, or you can't breathe. Depends on the particular case. So that's polio. That's how the virus does it. Really important point is that only one in 100 or 200 infections actually leads to this paralytic disease. Most of the time, you don't even know you're infected. You're asymptomatic, asymptomatically infected, right? No symptoms. You have no idea. You're shedding virus, and it can spread to others. So the paralysis is rare, but if you have enough kids infected, you get substantial numbers of paralysis. And in the U.S., we had 30, 40, 50,000 cases a year of kids who are paralyzed. In some cases, this was permanent. So this is not a good thing. And of course, in other parts of the world, many tens of thousands of cases. So yeah, FDR, actually, the U.S. president, had polio himself, and he decided to uh, fund the development of vaccines. He founded what was called the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis. He raised a lot of money. And the two vaccines that, that he supported are the two that we still use today. There was no NIH at the time. No company was going to do this. So he actually funded their development in, in laboratories. Okay, so the two vaccines we have, the first one developed was by Jonas Salk. And by the way, the other day I was in chat GPT and I, I wrote, who is the best known uh, virologist in the field of polio? And Jonas Salk came up. <laughs> Not surprising. <laughs> I was hoping I, I would come up, but, you know, Jonas is a very <laughs> famous guy. Um, so in the 1950s, he developed what's called IPV, inactivated poliovirus vaccine. And what you do there is you grow the virus in the lab, huge quantities. 
and then you treat it with a chemical so it's no longer infectious. And then you take that, you put it in a needle, and you inject yourself in the arm and in the muscle, very much like the COVID vaccines, we get these. You put it in the muscle, you then get make an immune response, and that protects you against getting paralytic disease. Now, what's important is it doesn't block infection. Uh -huh. You can still swallow polio. It will still reproduce in your gut. You'll still shed it. But when it gets into the blood, then the immunity induced by that IPV will, will stop it and you won't get paralyzed. All right. So that's, that's what it was tested for, to prevent paralysis, and it works pretty well. And we're using IPV to this day. Now, in 1960... Or 61, it was decided to switch, at least in the U.S., to a different kind of polio vaccine that was in development at the same time called OPV, oral polio vaccine. And this was developed by Albert Sabin. And Sabin and Salk, by the way, were like, like oh, they were oh, yeah. they're really enemies of each other. Mm -hmm. Sabin's vaccine is infectious. You drink it, and it goes into your intestine. It multiplies. You shed it and you get great immunity. And for a while, you go, you have immunity in your intestines. But as you know, antibody levels always go down a few months after immunization. So even people who get OPV can still uh, get infected a bit and shed some virus. But that uh, OPV, of course, also prevents paralysis. And mm -hmm. the cool thing about OPV is you just drink it. You don't need any needles. It's really easy to give, and it's pretty cheap. So in the U.S., we switched to OPV in 1961, and we used it for many years. Now, the problem with OPV is that in a certain number of kids, the number is about 1 in 1 1.4 million doses, the vaccine causes paralysis of the kids. The very disease it's meant to prevent, it's actually causing. And it does that because when, the, when you ingest OPV, it reproduces into your gut, it loses all of the changes that Albert Sabin uh, had in that virus to make it not cause disease, they go away. Mm -hmm. And you shed what we call revertants, and those can circulate, and they cause vaccine-associated paralysis. In mm -hmm. the U.S., we used to have 8 to 10 cases a year until finally, by 2000, it was decided this is, not, this is a risk we're not any longer willing to take. And so we switched to back to IPV. And that's what we use to this day because IPV doesn't cause polio if it's prepared properly, at least. Uh, and um, you can't even use Sabin any longer in the U.S. It's been the license has been taken away. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's a that's a big deal, right? You have a licensed vaccine, and then the FDA says we're no longer licensing this. So the problem is that OPV is still used by the WHO, and it's eradication effort in many many countries in the world. It's being used, and it's causing vaccine-associated paralysis in many of those countries. All right, so I I have a problem with that because if it's not good enough for the U.S., why should it be good enough for any other country? Right? That's it's that's humanity, in my right. opinion. Right. So yeah. some people have wanted to fix this, and so uh, and in particular, Bill Gates. So Bill Gates funds a lot of the uh, polio vaccine effort. He gives money to pay for the polio vaccine and distribute it. He said a few years ago, why don't we make a polio vaccine that, that does not revert? He actually had this idea. I mean, we've all been thinking about it for years, but he had the money, so he funded a couple of labs to work on uh, engineering OPV so that, well, they initially said it couldn't revert. Mm -hmm. As you'll see, it does revert, but it, it's less. So a new strain was 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 made and it's called NOPV2. So this is just for the type 2 uh, component of OPV. The type 2 is problematic because when it reverts, and it, cir it circulates very extensively. And um, we also declared type 2 eradicated in uh, 2016. We removed the type 2 from the vaccine, and so type 2 immunity globally is, has gone down. And whenever there's some type 2 vaccine uh, circulating strain, it can cause paralysis. There are lots of cases of paralysis caused by OPV2 in Africa. And so NOPV2 was was uh, designed, and this was tested in the laboratory in cells and, and in transgenic mice 
for the polio receptor, which were developed in my lab, by the way, to study uh, polio in animals. Uh, and it looked like it might be genetically more stable. Then it was tested in a phase one, a phase two, and a phase three trial uh, in people. And then uh, a few years ago, it was deployed by the WHO. And it has been given to about 600 million kids in a variety of countries, including uh, Africa and Asia. And we've now got some of the first data about how uh, NOPV2 is performing. I mean, it performs, immunologically, it performs just like OPV2. It protects against uh, paralysis. Um, it, it does, it can cause paralysis. So there were recently seven cases of paralysis in kids in Africa uh, who had been immunized with NOPV2. So, but it is much less uh, reverting than um, OPV2. So with 600 million kids immunized, you would expect 40 to 50 cases of OPV2 paralysis, and we had seven with NOPV2. So it's an improvement, right? Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> I think, I don't think any kid would be paralyzed with a vaccine. So of course, I think we could still, I think we could still do better. I'm not sure that we can do better with OPV because here's the thing that's really, really interesting. When oh, when you take OPV and it starts to reproduce in your gut, it reverts uh, within a few days. And every kid who gets the vaccine, it reverts. But not only that, it recombines with other viruses in your gut, other viruses like polio that we all have. And so the, the vaccine revertants that you shed are actually recombinants and the pieces of the genome of other viruses that are now present in the OPV revergence are from other enteroviruses. And that's the same for an OPV2. I, I was at polioeradication.org today, and uh, they were summarizing that, yeah, an OPV2 gets recombined. It removes all the changes they put in to make it more stable. Right? So yeah. you, you, you cannot fight that because recombination removes whatever you put in that you think is going to fix it. And so... I, I think using an infectious uh, vaccine is is never going to eradicate the virus because these strains will always circulate as long as you use them. And, you know, right now, one of the big issues is we look for kids who are paralyzed as a sign that the virus is circulating. But in fact, that's only one in 100 or 200 infections, right? right. So recently, we've started to do wastewater surveillance in the U.S. to look for polio, specifically after the case last uh, summer in New York, mm -hmm. and it's there. Polio virus is there in the U.S. Mm -hmm. because it circulates silently. And so, you know, we've been saying for years that polio is eradicated in the U.S., but it's not because it's in the waste where it's obviously reproducing in people, although it's not causing paralysis because mm -hmm. they're immunized, right? So I think we should just not not focus on eradication anymore, just getting rid of paralytic polio. Right. Errad eradicate disease and not necessarily the virus. Exactly. I yeah. think it's always hard to, to eradicate a virus. I mean, we're lucky with smallpox. Frankly, we did eradicate mm -hmm. that because for smallpox virus, every infection, you get the rash. Okay, so when you see a kid with a rash, smallpox rash, that's all there is. And you can immunize it around that kid and stop the transmission. But polio is has a lot of asymptomatic transmission, so I don't think mm -hmm. we can ever eradicate it. So that's the story with IPV, OPV, and, and NOP. Right. Yeah. Uh, I think that breaks down a lot of inf good information that people who might not understand polio vaccines often often miss. For sure. Um, and one thing that I see commonly when it comes to polio vaccination is the fact that OPV can cause paralysis in a rare number of children who get the vaccine. And that is usually held up as evidence that vaccines are harmful. Uh, but there's not just the scenario of whether or not we get... There, there are three scenarios here. We either give people OPV and we have some paralysis, which I agree is unacceptable. We give kids IPV, which is much lower risk, uh, especially if it's prepared correctly. But the third scenario, which I think that most people who have problems with vaccinations are going for, is no vaccine. Mm -hmm. And I think with no vaccine, I mean, what kind of... You, you, you touched on it. We'd have tens of thousands of cases of paralysis. 
as opposed to, you know, single double digit numbers with vaccines. I mean, I know that the problem with uh, not vaccinating is, is exactly that because you will have increasing numbers of kids who aren't vaccinated. You have ten thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of kids not immune. And you will have, we'll go back to the big outbreaks of polio that we had in the 30s and 40s, right? Mm -hmm. 30, 40, 50,000 cases a year. And we see that happening in Africa because circulating vaccine derived viruses are there, right? They're, they're derived from the immunization campaigns. And then a country here or a country there will let its vaccination rates drop because they say, oh, there's no polio. Why do we need to vaccinate? And then suddenly you have outbreaks of, of polio. So mm -hmm. it exactly mimics the situation if you stopped immunizing or chose not to immunize. It's not acceptable if you don't want to have your kid paralyzed. Right. Right. And and I think, uh, you know, of course it's unacceptable to accept those those uh, cases, those paralytic cases. Uh, but another thing you talked about that I think a lot of people don't realize is that, yeah, polio vaccines do not prevent transmission of polio. They don't right. eliminate the virus. And I think a lot of people have this idea that vaccines are supposed to eradicate viruses uh, because of, probably because of what happened with smallpox. That might be their perception, but also because we treat, when we say someone has polio, it's because they have disease. And as you said, yeah. the disease portion, the paralysis portion is much rarer. Most often people will just have a flu-like symptom and not even realize that it's a polio virus that could be causing it. It's worth, it's worth pointing out that with IPV, you will never stop transmission. Right. Because IPV does not immunize the intestines. So you will be infected. You will shed. You'll just be protected against paralysis, which is the goal. Now, with OPV, you'll have a period of a few months where the antibody levels in your intestinal mucosa are high enough to impede uh, infection. In mm -hmm. transmission, not to eliminate it entirely, mm -hmm. but just impede it. But then after those two, three months are up, now your, your intestines are going to be susceptible until the memory kicks in in your intestines, which may be a few days. And so for a few days, you're going to be infected and shedding. So yeah, you're, you're not, stopping transmission is really not in the cards for any vaccine in, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Right. And, but that, I think that with the COVID pandemic, especially, um, that concept was lost on people and confused a lot of people because we started vaccinating with SARS-CoV-2 and we saw that the virus wasn't going away and people said, well, why, is, why isn't that the case? We did it with polio, yeah. but we didn't do it with polio. So yeah, it's true. important to understand uh, what, if, what actually affects these things. Yeah, it was a, the, the pandemic really brought out... Um, the, the shallow understanding of how vaccines work, right? So we, we tested the Moderna and the Pfizer mRNA vaccines. You know, they were over 90% effective at preventing COVID, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. well, we were just measuring disease back then. We weren't measuring uh, infection. And then the press said, aha, uh -huh, yeah, the vaccines, they're, they're working. And then three months later, people start to get infected. People who were already vaccinated, they start to get uh, mild disease. And that was the evidence for mm -hmm. being reinfected. And the press says, look, they failed. They didn't stop infection. But th that they didn't fail. They, they stopped severe disease, and that's what vaccines do. They don't stop infection. So, yeah, there was a huge misunderstanding on, on many people's parts, and I hope many people have now learned that uh, that's how vaccines work, including the polio vaccines. They stop you from getting paralysis. When Jonas Salk ran his clinical trial mm -hmm. in 1954, he gave kids polio vaccine or placebo, mm -hmm. and he looked to see who got polio. That's it. He didn't see who was infected, just who got paralytic disease, and that was the measure of the efficacy of the, of the vaccine. Right, right. Which And that, that placebo was a saline placebo, which some people will deny ever happens in <laughs> vaccine clinical trials. Um, but <laughs> so I, I think it, it also speaks to the fact that Technology has improved a lot, and the press hasn't really kept up with the way we, uh, our capabilities as molecular biologists. Because back in those times, uh, with the polio vaccine clinical trials, unlike today, where we were, where we have 
uh, PCR testing and rapid antigen testing, and everyone can test themselves for infection. You couldn't do that back then. So, uh, but I think that if they were to do it back then, and even now, if we were to be testing everybody's guts for polio vaccine, which uh, sewage water is a proxy for, yeah, people would be surprised. People would be oh, surprised. absolutely, absolutely, and and you know the first COVID trials, the Moderna and Pfizer, you couldn't look for infection. You would have to test people every day after they get immunized for right. months, and that's was it feasible they needed to do it quickly right and get the results quickly so mm-hmm. but that's not the way any vaccine trial had ever been done before so you could do it nowadays you could have people test themselves at home right every day and ask if you got infected but uh, i don't see that there would be much of a value in that because yeah you would be infected after a few months after the vaccination right mm-hmm. so it's not really useful yeah yeah so I think also the other thing, Dan, is, is oh, yeah. that a source of the problem is that the press, you know, the press are not scientists, right? Mm-hmm. So they their job is to talk to people and then write a story based on what they hear. That's how they're trained. And so the key is who they talk to. Mm-hmm. And that's where the problems arose in this pandemic. They didn't talk to the right people. Uh, they, If you want to learn about vaccine immunity, viral vaccine immunity. You talk to a virologist or a viral immunologist, but the press often goes to MDs who are perceived to know everything. I don't mean to be snarky at all, okay? MDs are great in their own field, but often they don't know about viruses or viral immunity. So they will say, yeah, vaccines stop infection. That's the way they work. And the press takes it and runs with them. Mm -hmm. And then once you say something like that, it's really hard to pull it back yeah. and say, oh, this isn't right. People don't care about corrections. All they care about is the original statement. So this has been a real source of issue. And that it's only because the pandemic was so huge, right? In other vaccines, not similar, uh, so many infections, so the press wasn't as interested. But in this one, it was, and, and that was a big problem. So so you, you've you been in academia for, for a while now. Uh, and, and you're obviously very willing to talk to people, to do podcasts, to talk to press, to educate people about your field. But um, how common do you think that attitude is in your field? Well, when I started uh, podcasting and blogging, you know, 2006 or so, uh, very few people in my field were doing that. Mm-hmm. Um, I was kind of a pioneer. Um, and most so the problem is science is really hard, as mm-hmm. you know, and mm-hmm. you need to put all well, your time into it if you're going to get it to work. You can't do other things. I mean, it's hard enough to have a family and <laughs> do yeah. science, as you well know. Yes. So to do science in a family that doesn't leave time for anything else. So people uh, wouldn't do anything. I was unusual, I guess. I wanted to try something different. And uh, even to this day, more people are certainly involved in communicating science, uh, but they don't do it in a way that involves a podcast or a video. They do it at social media. Instagram is lends itself well to making little pictures that explain things, Twitter and Facebook. But still, the vast majority of scientists do not educate the vast public. They just teach their classes as, as they have to. And the reason is because it takes time to do it effectively, right? Mm-hmm. So now that's all I do. I closed my lab last year yep. and decided that my biggest impact could be teaching people about viruses and all the other subjects of my podcast. Uh, I can have a bigger impact doing that than, than doing research. But I, I view myself as setting an example. Here are the things that you can do. Try something, just mm-hmm. do something, but f- for sure, Far less than 50% of my colleagues do any kind of communicating. In my department at Columbia, there are, I don't know, 15 faculty. I don't think any of them do any sort of communicating. They're just so focused on getting grants and and running their lab that they can't. So, And that's a problem because I think we should be the ones talking to the public. You you know the impact of TWIB on on public understanding of virology. It's really big. Yeah. 
if we had other people in other fields doing similar things, I think we'd be way better off because we maybe would would have so many misunderstandings about uh, the basics that we have now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you you mentioned earlier, and I think that this is an appropriate <clears throat> frame to ask you about this because you mentioned earlier um, Jonas Salk and Sabin were kind of like this, mm -hmm. and I, I thought it was interesting in um, Peter Oshinsky's book about about the history of polio, how he described Salk as the kind of media man who would go and talk to the press and be kind of like the celebrity, where, whereas Sabin would say things like, scientists don't talk to the press, scientists stay in their labs, and he's not a real scientist because he talks to the press. And I think that is such an interesting uh, conflict it, within the scientific community where um, Salk wanted to obviously, I mean, I, I'm, maybe his motives were more selfish, but he, you have this guy on one hand who wants to talk to the public and encourage uh, them to look at the science he's doing and understand it and accept it. And another one who says they should just accept it without us talking about talking to them. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think, I, I think that that conflict of attitudes have has persisted to this day because you know um a lot of people choose not to a lot of people in science choose not to try to communicate at all but there are still others who will actively tell scientists who are trying to communicate that they're wasting their time or that they're sure. seen as you know not doing as much in the lab because they're taking time to communicate and i think that's i think that's a shame no and it's absolutely true. I, I felt a lot of pushback early on when I was communicating. Why are you doing this? It doesn't do you any good. It's not getting you grants, right? It's uh, not doing your experiments. But um, I, I, I think you have to overcome that, right? And I think our success is a good way of overcoming it because I get less criticism now. People say, oh, well, you have a big reach. And yeah, if you do this, you can influence a lot of people. I mean, the number of people who write and thank me for, you know, keeping them sane, thank us, is, is enormous. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as a scientist, you can have a similar uh, impact. So it doesn't have to be one or the other. You know, it could be a blend of both. You can do both. You don't have to do communicating the way I have, where I'm I've tried everything and, and see how it works. But I think what what our value is, besides informing people, is that we said, look, you can do this as a scientist. Many of our podcasters are working scientists. Right. Some of them are retired. Some of them do other things. But many of them are scientists and they get it to work, right? Because I provide a platform for them and they sit down and, and just talk and uh, share their knowledge. So... Mm -hmm. You know, we're certainly not where we should be in, in terms of scientists communicating, but we're getting there. And, and the more, you know, that's why I, I have a tagline on Microbe TV, science shows by scientists, right? It's, yeah. That's really the thing in that I think we are well positioned to teach people mm -hmm. um, right from the source. You know, you can get the excitement, you can get the failures all from the source. That's always how I, uh, how I envisioned it. And you know, the fact that we had troubles during COVID means we don't have enough scientists communicating. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we ever will, you know, because they're always going to have to go through the press. But if you can build up this cadre of scientist communicators like I've been trying to do, it could be better. Yeah, I, I agree. Because if we if we don't do that, then, you know, the general public aren't going to read our papers. No. Because I think no. that, I mean... Only a tiny fraction of the public can even understand the words in an abstract, and that's sure. not their fault. We we make it we make it hard to understand in a way. Uh, but yeah, if we don't take the time to break down what our papers mean and what 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 findings, uh, what advances we can actually make uh, from our findings, then the press is going to try to do it. And sure. if the press doesn't understand either, because they go to talk to a scientist and the scientist doesn't want to talk to them or isn't great at communicating their work clearly, then the press is going to get it wrong and the public's going to get it wrong and no one's going to really, people are going to benefit less from the work that scientists put in. And so I, uh, well, sorry, go ahead. 
I'm sorry, I interrupted you, so I always do that. Go ahead, finish. <laughs> oh, I was just going to say, and and it also leaves room for people who want to disinform and right. um, misinform the public for their own personal political or monetary benefits uh, to come in and make stuff up. And, and I was going to say, you know, why do they want to misinform? But you just put it there, personal, mm -hmm. political, and monetary benefits. It's huge, mm -hmm. right? Yep. There's um, always so... It's a big motivator for them, and they, that to me it tells me they have no conscience because people's lives are at stake. Mm -hmm. You're playing with them. But um, I have a student in my undergraduate Columbia virology class this year. She's a mm. she's a, a writer. She's a journalist. She's been writing for twenty years. And um, I asked her why are you taking this course, and she said because virology coverage by the press is abysmal, yeah, it is. and she wants to improve it. And I think. That's great that one uh, journalist wants to fix it and realizes there are issues. Now, people get defensive when you say your coverage is abysmal, but you know, you're not a scientist. You don't have the right uh, interpretation, and you just interpret what people say, and if you don't get the right person, um, you're going to be wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and, and then uh, <clears throat> also, you know, recently... Uh, when the when the general public gets things really wrong and um oh by, by the way i've heard you talk about that student on twiv and i think mm -hmm. that's fantastic um that they're doing that uh, that's that's just really great um, i wish that more universities had um science communication courses uh that gen ed majors or uh, non-science majors could could take yeah. Yeah, um, I, I have full intention of pulling her into the microbe TV fold and oh yeah, having her work with us because I think she can help us and we can help her in, in the long run. And she's happy to do that. So that's that should be interesting. That's great. Yeah, but an another thing that I've seen recently with um, the press not really getting science and having uh, they 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 tend to. Um, accidentally platform people um, mm. who are going to be the ones who want to misinform, disinform for whatever reason. Um, and there's, they don't have the knowledge to push back on them. I, yeah. I saw this the other day with, uh, I think it was Piers Morgan interviewing RFK Jr. And it's not that RFK Jr. is right in anything he says. He's wrong. He's been a rabid anti-vaxxer for decades. Um, but Piers didn't have the base knowledge to yeah. counter anything that he said. But if you had a scientist up there, it would be like, it would be like, you know, they could do it in their sleep. Uh, of course. But because you had that situation, then RFK Jr. just looks really good. And that's <laughs> worrying because I just can imagine on his campaign trail, he's he might bring up polio vaccines. And when he sure. brings up this NOPV vaccine and says, look, you know, they're paralyzing kids in Africa with it. Um, you know, he, he's going to state that message and no one's going to know what he's talking about. And so no one's going to be able to counter him and uh, he'll just run with it. And the lie will, the lie will travel so far before um, people like you and uh, other virologists can say, no, that is completely wrong. You have no clue what you're talking about. Go away. <laughs> Yeah, once something gets out there, it's hard to counter it. Uh, you know, certain people will seek out uh, information, so they'll come to us. Um, they, you know, this person said this. What What do you make of it? And we mm -hmm. can we can correct it. And you do the same on your programs. It's mm -hmm. what should be done. Everybody should be doing that. Not everyone, but more more scientists should be willing to take on uh, these uh, these these incorrect claims. Mm -hmm. But as you know, it's not trivial to make a video where you explain something, right? Yeah. So you were really good at saying, look at what this person said, this is why it's wrong. You don't just knock that off in five minutes, right? No. It takes hours. So that's why many scientists uh, don't want to get involved. And so I envision MicroTV as a platform where I could say to a scientist, come and sit down for 20 minutes and tell us why this is wrong. They come and go, they don't have to do anything more, we produce it. And it makes the barrier, the 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 bar lower for them mm -hmm. to, to come in. And so that's one of my goals. Yeah, I think that's great. Um, so to get back to a little bit to the science of polio, um, you know, on this channel, I 
I, I try to talk about misinformation and why it's wrong a lot of the time. Mm-hmm. So I thought I'd ask you, you know, what are some bits of misinformation or disinformation about polio vaccines that you've heard over the years that you think are just so they that you think just won't go away and you want to address it any, at every time any opportunity you get well you know it's interesting polio vaccines have i think been the least affected by misinformation uh, as we were talking about before i'm not sure why that is um maybe because they're really good right mm. um they work really well they they prevent polio with with the exception of opv you know we have a, a rare number of, of polio cases that are actually caused by the vaccine but uh, no one has to my knowledge ever uh used that as a negative for polio vaccines. I always interpreted it to mean that you know, the, the people who are anti-vaccines actually don't investigate particular vaccines in any depth. They just mm. listen to what people say. So Andrew Wakefield trashes uh, mm-hmm. MMR, MM, w, uh, M, what is it? Measles, mumps, rubella, yeah. MMR vaccine. Mm-hmm. And people just accept it. They don't even bother to go to the literature and see if what he's saying is true or not. And so people have not picked on the polio vaccines. Mm. Uh, the one bit of misinformation that uh, is propagated by some scientists, in fact, is this notion that uh, OPV in particular, oral polio vaccine, can stop transmission. Mm-hmm. For sure, IPV cannot. It's very clear. There are plenty of data out there that show if you've got a full course of IPV immunization, you get infected even uh, weeks after the immunization, the virus will still reproduce in your gut. There's, there's no question about that. Mm-hmm. But um, the OPV, you will get a transient uh, antibody induction in the gut. It'll protect you from infection for a few months, but then that goes away. It's not sustained, and so you can uh, be infected. So this idea that OPV will stop transmission is just not right. Mm-hmm. Um, the other the other this information is that polio vaccines have have dangerous adjuvants, right? The adjuvants are a common target mm-hmm. of anti-vaxxers, right? They're toxic chemicals supposedly put in vaccines. Well, in fact, yep. polio vaccines don't have any adjuvants, <laughs> right? For OPV, you wouldn't need one because it's reproducing and it's doing its own inflammation. Mm-hmm. But the IPV, in theory, could use an adjuvant, but it's never been necessary. It does a great job at inducing uh, immune responses. But this is the sort of thing that, oh, if you're slightly inclined to being uh, suspicious of vaccines and someone tells you, don't take the polio vaccine, it has an adjuvant, and you'll just accept it without looking. Maybe you don't know where to look or how to look or who to ask, and maybe that's part of the problem. But uh, yeah, you'll just accept it and say, yeah, but that's not true. There no, there's no adjuvants in the polio vaccines. Um, what other ones... Have I heard there was one other? Well, that polio vaccines all cause paralysis, which we, we just said is not true, right. no matter which one it is. The the initial lot of IPV that was made in the 50s, one of the lots, did cause paralysis because mm-hmm. it was made properly. But after that was fixed, IPV has never right. caused paralysis. And, and OPV, as we said, uh, only rare. So no need to impugn uh, all the vaccines, all the polio vaccines. Right, right. That IPV uh, case was the Cutter incident. That's and, right. Yeah. And uh, changed a lot about um, manufacturing laws. Yeah, which is to make sure. nicely described in this book here. The Paul Cutter, Offit. Yeah. By Paul Offit, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this is an interesting situation because this really began the era of product uh, litigation for biologicals where, you know, if you make something and it hurts people, even if you made it the right way, you're still liable. Mm-hmm. And this haunts us to this day. Right. Yep. Yep. And that's another thing. Vaccine companies are exa- are absolutely liable if they make they their are. products improperly um, and send them out to the market. Uh, some a lot of people who don't like vaccines will say that vaccine companies have complete immunity, and that's not true. No, no, no. Um. One one thing that <laughs> I'll just try to get your reaction to. Uh, that I've seen in the dark corners of the internet, because you know, I whenever I'm going to make a video, I'm seeing what's 
what's circulating in these anti-vaccine circles. So I see all sorts of weird and out there stuff. And when it comes to polio vaccines, I think one of the common ones that um, I actually saw an anti-vaxxer trying to revive who has a, he has a pretty sizable following uh, is this idea that um, it wasn't polio vaccines that got rid of polio disease. It was instead stopping the use of DDT pesticide. <laughs> so how do you react to that? <laughs> God, it was the idea that DDT was paralyzing kids. Yeah. Right. No, that, uh, that's, there, there's ample evidence that that's not the case. Of course, that we know that uh, kids who, who uh, got paralyzed have polio virus in them. And the best evidence is we give them a vaccine against that virus and it prevents you from getting uh, polio virus. So, has nothing to do with uh, the vaccine at all. And there's some other rumors too that polio was spread by flies. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. None of that is is true. Of course, it's spread by person to person contact. Yeah. Yeah. He seems to be blamed for a lot of things. Right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, a lot a lot of times when people will make that claim, they'll look at U.S. data, but not every nation stopped using DDT at the same time, and so even yeah. if it correlates with disease number uh, disease numbers yeah. you can't explain the global drop in polio cases as yeah. polio vaccines are introduced to each country so yeah it's it, it's one of those silly ridiculous ones that <laughs> i thought maybe people would be interested in seeing your reaction to <laughs> it's just crazy D I, i've i was recently asked a dd ddt question by uh so about another viral disease and I said, no no ddc tdt has nothing to do with that and it's very clear you know you have to look at the data but it's very very clear that there's no connection and maybe as you said sometimes there are correlations or associations mm -hmm. right you know you tie your shoes and it rains does that mean tying your shoes or is this a rain no it's an association that happens all the time when there are you know billions of people in the world and lots of things happening they're going to happen by coincidence at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, the best story is from Paul Off. And he said, you know, his wife is a pediatrician. She's given a baby a vaccine. The baby mm -hmm. is sitting on her mother's lap in the in the office. She's about to give the shot, and the baby has a seizure yep. before she gives her the shot. So if, if the shot had been given first and then the seizure happened, there's no information that would convince that mother that it was not due to the shot. Right. 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 And so that's the strength of uh, association. It's yeah. hard to beat it sometimes. Yeah. And I remember a while ago on TWIV, Rich Condit read a um, an email from a listener who told a story of they were going to take their uh, elderly, elderly relative who had dementia for a COVID vaccine, and it got delayed by a week. And within the time of that delay before they had gotten their first vaccination that mm. that relative had passed away and you know that's the exact kind of yeah. correlation that people would prey upon for fear and to have them listen to their misinformed message so yeah just really <laughs> you have to look at more than just those particular instances those one-offs and when yeah, you do right. when you do you see the larger picture i mean that's why to test drugs and vaccines you need a controlled trial to eliminate mm -hmm. these random events that happen when you're just making observations right? you mm -hmm. give a control group and a placebo group and you uh you, t you compare them and then that's the best you can do right it's what we call the gold standard it's not perfect Mm -hmm. But it's really the best to eliminate these uh, these associations that just happen randomly. All right. Well, Vincent, I think that we've been talking for about 45 minutes now. Is there anything that we haven't talked about that you want to talk about? I, I just, there are a ton of things. Yeah, I could talk for, for hours, <laughs> of course. But, uh, you know, if I, I, I wish people would have a greater faith in vaccines. I'm not sure why. Uh, they don't. For example, um, as you know, recently, and, and I think you did a video on this, it was found that when you get mRNA vaccines, COVID vaccines, 
uh, after uh, a few of them, you, you class switch your antibodies from uh. IgG1 to IgG4. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I, I'm amazed at the amount of misinformation that has spread from, from that observation. On the live stream one night, uh, there was a, a woman um, who we were praising, you know, the, the effects of the COVID mRNA vaccines. They were really had done a good job. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, she said, you guys don't know what you're talking about. Did you know that they cause class switching? <laughs> and um, so I, the, the comment had been actually taken off by a moderator, but I decided to answer it because I think it was a teaching moment to mm -hmm. say, you know, class switching is a thing that happens normally, mm -hmm. and it's, it's not a problem. Those IgG4 antibodies can neutralize SARS-CoV-2. Mm -hmm. And more relevant is the fact that, you know, these vaccines have been in, in millions of people and they prevent disease. If there were really an issue with IgG4, we wouldn't see that happening. Mm -hmm. So, you know, unfortunately, the, the paper result was spun by anti-vaxxers as being yep. bad, which, which is always a, you, it's always something you can do when you're not sure what something means, right? Mm -hmm. So they'll say, oh, there's a switch to IgG4. And then the, in, in the last paragraph, we'll say, we don't know what the significance of this. So the anti-vaxxers will grab that and say, this is bad. That scientists don't know what it does. And they're mm -hmm. preying on the natural reluctance of scientists to draw premature conclusions to say something is bad. And that's just not fair. Exactly. Because there's zero evidence that IgG4 is an issue. So this is going to happen all the time. Throughout the pandemic, it happened over and over, right? Molnupiravir causes mutations that are going to make you uh, grow an extra arm. Mm -hmm. um, what was the other one? Oh, uh, the mRNA vaccines are going to integrate into your DNA and cause problems in 15 years. Mm -hmm. And all of this could be avoided if you not listen to the negatives and just look at the science. And, you know, the the problem is for most people, they can't do that. So they have to seek out good sources like yourself and, and our programs and others that are going to tell you what's going on. And there's no need to distrust us. We don't have any agenda. No one's paying us mm -hmm. to say these things, right? Mm -hmm. Anti-vaxxers are being paid to spread anti-vaccine information. They make a living, a living doing that, right? Mm -hmm. and, and science communicators uh, do not. So... Um, right really look at the source of the information. And uh, I, th I think the, the most important thing here is that the COVID pandemic has really brought out the flaws uh, in our science communication enterprise and mm -hmm. the distrust that people have uh, in science and scientists. And it's just something we're going to have to build back up again. Mm -hmm. It's not going to happen quickly. One last thing is that let's, let's end it on polio. So what yeah. What is going to happen with polio? So I, as I said earlier, I don't think we can eradicate polio virus because there are too many infections where there's no symptoms and we can't tell that the virus is in you, right? There's only one in 100 or 200 cases of paralysis in, in all the infections. So you can never know that the virus is gone, right? Even if you don't see any paralysis, the virus may still be there. So you can't say that it's eradicated. So what are we going to do? Well, I, I think we need to make sure the world is polio free and polio meaning the disease, yeah. right? That should be our goal. We have vaccines that can do that. Maybe they need to be tweaked in some way or improved. And I think we should still uh, keep working on improving the vaccine so we can get away from a needle, for example, mm -hmm. uh, and get away from a vaccine that can actually cause paralysis. I think those would all be good goals. And the, the, the difficulty there is that because we're, we were so supposedly so close to eradication, uh, m many countries said, okay, you got to get rid of your polio in your lab. You can't work on it anymore. Mm. And so we're shutting down polio research. This is a big mistake because there's a lot of work to be done. And the reason we're shutting it down is because it's a perceived um, containment risk, yeah. right? If you have yeah. polio, you, maybe you're going to get polio. No, if you're vaccinated, you're not going to get polio. Right. You should be able to continue to work on a virus that is throughout the wastewater everywhere. So what's the point of getting rid of it in the labs where, you know, the, the research we could do would be important. So I please rethink this idea of getting rid of all the polio virologists. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that we need to 
focus more on better vaccines, maybe just, or just ways of implementing IPV better in, yeah. in the world, you know, maybe help maybe dedicate resources to eliminating health inequities so that back needles or other ways of administering IPV could be more accessible to countries that still are threatened by polio, polio virus. So thank you, Vincent, for being here. I really appreciate you taking the time. And for those of my viewers who have not listened to TWIV or are not subscribed to TWIV on podcast listening app, please do so. Uh, they are, in my opinion, the best source of virology and uh, science in general on the podcasting space. So please go do that and check out Microbe TV. Thanks, Dan. It was a pleasure being here, and uh, we should do it again. You should come back on Twib sometime. That was fun when you came. Oh, God, I'd be happy to. <laughs> we could go over some of the more recent uh, debunkings that you've done, you know. It's always fun to do that. Oh, um, it would be an honor and a pleasure. So sure. let's, let's keep in touch. Will do. Thank you, Dan. All right, Vincent. Thank you.